So I'm originally from Pakistan, and um, I'm Madhya Sosan, by the way. Okay. <laughs> and um, and I am a motivational speaker. Okay, mm -hmm. wonderful. So you're originally uh, from Pakistan. Were you born in Pakistan? Yes, I was born in Pakistan. So my dad came here when um, I was three. Okay. Um, so I didn't see my dad for uh, four years. Um, and um, yeah, so um, we didn't have anywhere to go. So we um, went to uh, live with my auntie and uncles. Mm -hmm. uh, for four years, so it was just it's just three of us, me and my mum and dad. Yeah. What made your dad move to England? Um, he he came here to have like have a better life because we didn't have enough money in Pakistan. So um, so my uncle was here, so he, you know we um, he sponsored him so to work here. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so he was just here working while you know obviously sending money to me and my mom in Pakistan. Um, did you speak English? Uh, no, I did you didn't not. Speak I did not. I was actually afraid of school because when I was in Pakistan, I don't know in in Pakistan at that time whether it's the same case now or not. Um, the teachers are quite harsh in Pakistan. Um, so when I was like around three, four year old, the teacher, there was one teacher who I didn't like at all. She, she you know, she used to like um, stand me in front of the class and ask me to read something. I was like, okay. So I would stand in front of the class, read, try and try to read something. And if I couldn't pronounce anything, she would, she was quite abusive. So she would hit me. She would punch me in the back, um, right in front of all the kids. Um, and um, because of that childhood sort of it kind of left a trauma in sick kids you, you you know in teachers in pakistan i don't know she she used to hit with rulers and things like that so that kind of gets buried mm. inside of you so when i came to the U uh, uk i thought the uk schools will be exactly the same you know the teachers hit you shout at you um and so for for a couple of months i used to cry in school because i was just like oh my god she's, she's gonna hit me any minute but but um but yeah it's surprisingly it was nice the teachers were more gen gentle mm -hmm. than they were in pakistan where did you live did you live in a, in a house or a flat yeah or? we lived in a house so we didn't have um, money enough money to have um to, uh, to pay the heating because at that time my, my dad was working multiple jobs mm -hmm. still trying to earn money um, and um, so we had like I remember we had them um, we had one heater and one bed in the living room and we didn't have anything else um, um, so my dad and my mom gave me the bed while they slept on the floor wow. so for 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 a, two years uh, that was the case but um, you know, we are, we used to sit around um, around the small heater, play Ludo, or uh, we used to have you know the, in Pakistan they call carom board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was it, at that time I didn't really think I don't have anything. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was just it's amazing being around my mom and dad, and we play we get to play games together, we get to go to park together. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't as a child I didn't really want anything mm -hmm. i wasn't like oh you're going to um you know she when we used to go shopping i wasn't one of those like i want this i want that i want this i want that I it was just i didn't i appreciated and um because when i was in pakistan we didn't have anything mm -hmm. when i came here we had a bed and everything it's like wow that's amazing yeah yeah we you had a bed, bed yeah wow <laughs> we have a heater it would uh, it, it hit my parents more because they were obviously they lived there they were born there uh, for many many years and I was only seven when I came so I when I came here um, I kind of um, I was okay I mean mm. I didn't really it wasn't hard for me to mm. adjust to the um, environment here. I think language was a bit of a barrier okay first, that was the hardest. Um, I spoke I spoke Urdu and everyone else was English but then um, I used to watch um, TV shows and everything and I quickly picked up uh, English quite because you know when you're young mm. you pick up things yeah. quite easily um, that was one of the hardest thing and the other hardest thing was making friends because of the language mm. I didn't have any friends mm -hmm. um, I use, uh, but my only um, every time I, I go through uh, hardships or whatever sports is always been my friend mm -hmm. so I used to play cricket I was captain of my cricket uh, in, in primary school cricket team I've always been one of those has never been planning ahead sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I've always just 
enjoyed the moment mm -hmm. so things so I didn't really have a plan to be or oh, become a doctor or this and that I actually wanted to be a I wanted to be some some do something in sports but um, my parents were like no no it's just a hobby it's just a hobby you know so um, so I didn't really go into that too much but your parents were fine with you playing cricket like yeah. I know a lot of I parents that I was the only girl um, yeah, so in thinking. Um, a cricket team and I ended up I was because my dad used to train me um, ah, okay. we, we used to play cricket in the park mm. quite a lot um, and, um, and and I just ended up taking wickets and hitting sixes and everything and and um, one of the teachers went up straight to the principal she's like you need to have a look at this this mm. girl needs to be in your team mm. um, and he came and was like yep yeah, yep yeah, are you available for the next match it's like when is it I was like yeah I'm available uh, but we need to get permission from your parents now my parents were one of those was like you should not play with guys <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> not traditional play with guys <laughs> Uh, so it took a lot of persuading, even the head teacher, they went, they came to our house asking for the permission for me to play. But then he saw how good I was mm. and was like, okay, but you are not saying, you're not touching a guy. Uh, we moved to uh, Levin Doom um, because we were in a such a uh, hurry to find a place. We ended up in a place where um, it was a damp and it wasn't completed so mm. it was a private rented place and, and at that time towards the end of leaving Barry my dad was diagnosed with cancer so um, so we ended up in um, you know a uh, place where so it, you, it was quite damp it was pretty bad how old were you at that time I was um, 11 I think okay so is that the age you start school yeah, yeah. So, so, seven, so your dad i uh, was diagnosed with cancer yeah but he was still working at the time yeah what did your dad work as um he he did uh, numerous jobs like he worked in takeaways he worked in um um news agencies mm -hmm. and things like that okay so then when he was diagnosed with cancer um what was the news what did the doctors say how did your parents react what was your reaction um my parents didn't tell me until we moved to Levinsum. Um, he, um, they, they kind of kept it within themselves because they didn't want me to worry. But mm -hmm. um, he was diagnosed with um, cancer in his bladder, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and uh, mm, they just told me that you know he's gonna be fine. They're just gonna do operation in six months and time. He's gonna be fine. So they, I was obviously quite worried, you mm -hmm. know. I, I, at that time, I did not know the how serious cancer is. Mm -hmm. I, I always thought it's just the cancer people get cured. Um, uh, but they didn't tell me that. The doctors told him that he has a year to live. They didn't tell me that. Mm -hmm. um, and he, six months later, they removed his bladder, um, and. He was fine. I mean, they, they gave him a good news that, okay, your, your cancer's gone from your bladder. Um, and, but um, he came back and then within six months, he passed away. Wow. Yeah. So at 12, the age of 12 or 13 years old. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, that was my dad, yeah. You're, you're, and how, how what, was you, what did you feel like at that time? Like, what was um, I think my initial reaction was, I was just numb. I did not, it can't. When he was his, uh, when he when he was final stages, when he was in the hospital a month before he passed away, that's when I f really found out that he's he's really gonna die. Mm. You know, I didn't. You know, throughout the year, my parents said he's gonna be fine. The doctor said he's gonna be fine. He's gonna be completely fine. He, they're giving him injections and medicines and everything. He'll be fine. Um, but when he was in the hospital, like almost paralyzed you know because it was spread mm -hmm. um that's when i found out you can when i visited him i had a fear of um hospitals so my dad said don't not to come to hospital um i'll speak to you on the phone mm -hmm. um and um i spoke to him on the phone he was great he was cheerful but when, and a week later a week before he passed away um he stopped breathing so everyone was rushing around in the house it's like what's going on um, and my mom's like, your doc your dad's uh, doctor said your dad's only got a couple of days to live. That was like, mm. what? You just he was on the phone to me, laughing and joking, and you telling me he's dying in the next couple of days. Mm. Um, and then I went, I ended up in, I went to the hospital, and the state of him, I didn't, you know, he 
and you can see his bones, it was the, the cancer was eating him. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so <clears throat> that was the biggest shock. And then a couple of days later, he passed away and I was still in the state of shock. Mm -hmm. I did not react and I didn't cry. I didn't, I was just normal. It mm -hmm. was like, it was like a delayed reaction. Um, we had people visited in our, in our house and I was just, um, you know, just talking to them, fine, laughing and joking, not realizing that my dad just passed away. Um, until they left, that's when it really hit me. That's when it really hit me. I just told them, you know, dad, if I've ever hurt you in any way, mm -hmm. you know, please forgive me. Um, so no. <laughs> said you know um, you're my child <coughs> my mom took it hard um, soon after my dad passed away she had a severe um, rheumatoid arthritis um, attack mm -hmm. um, so uh, within within the six months after my dad passed away she fell in mm -hmm. so I became a young child right at the age of 14 okay so right at back of my dad's death um, so she, she was bed bound for about a year um, with depression and anxiety of, and obviously this rheumatoid arthritis. Her fingers were kind of bending really, really fast mm -hmm. um, and doctors were quite worried. Um, but um, so I didn't really have the time to grieve the loss of my dad. From year seven, I was in year seven, year eight, nine and a bit of year 10, I missed school completely because of my dad's illness. Mm -hmm. And, um, and my mom, uh, caring for my mom. Mm -hmm. So I was in and out of school. Okay. Um, so barely passed my GCSEs. But um, knowing where I am now, um, at that time I was fearful that I missed my education, but knowing where I am now, it's possible to make a life for mm -hmm. yourself. Wow. Yeah, completely. But yeah, everything, when you're that age, you're like, yeah. everything's about education, yeah. right? Yeah. And you think you're going to fail. There's so much fear um, uh, thrown at you that if you don't pass your GCSEs, you a lot of kids yeah, are yeah. under pressure these yeah. days. Well, I went to college after school. Mm -hmm. um, I did business and ICT. Okay. Um, and because of all the pressures that was going on, I was suffering from anxiety a lot mm -hmm. because I was suppressing quite a lot of things in mm -hmm. um, and um, so I you know barely passed my GCSEs and then I went on to college I barely passed the um, gone past college so the next step was university but when I was in a, such a bad state mentally I was like I'm there's no way I, I need a break mm -hmm. because ever since my dad passed away it was just like go 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 looking after my mom this responsibility that responsibility you know the responsibility that kids don't do mm -hmm. so I ended up last eight years from 20 onwards um, I could not even leave the house without having panic attacks I used to have befrienders take me out to the park even go into my garden I used to have panic attacks mm -hmm. so I was cooped up for years and years and years inside my house and it, it, it was all down to me not being able to express the grief uh, the emotions and feelings mm -hmm. and bury them mm -hmm. um, rather than feeling it and um, my mom's never she's she, she's not the well, the doctor says she's not gonna recover mm -hmm. uh, but I have I have I live with a lot of faith that um, you know, sometimes people, you can heal yourself through mm -hmm. your mind, but it's just a case of um, if you know what to do. The change, well, um, this, okay, so I, have you heard of people who've had out-of-body experiences? Y yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so whether you uh, you believe in that or not, but that's something that changed me. If people ask me every time, um, how, what changed your life? It's like, there's no way around it, I have to tell you. Mm -hmm. Right, so basically, um, three years ago, um, I experienced the outer body experience. So I was laying on my bed, and um, all of a sudden, I felt, I felt a vibration. Now, I was an atheist, I did not believe in anything. Mm -hmm. um, and all of a sudden, I felt a vibration within my body, and I was in the sleep, I was awake. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, um, and I felt like something sort of lifted out. And I ended up in this place where everything was completely white, like, like you wouldn't even hurt my eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and while I was in that state, or state of consciousness, or place, or wherever, um, 
I just felt like I was home mm -hmm. and I had no fear like in this physical world I felt fear um, most of the time I was I was I felt unsafe I was frightened of everything um, in that state I was just I just felt blissful I felt unconditional love like this is where I'm originally from mm -hmm. um, and uh, while I was there there was beams of light and uh, from my understanding um, I thought there was souls without a physical appearance mm -hmm. um, and when I went up to one light um, it turned around and turned into a face of my dad mm -hmm. now he's but you don't even talk that it's like you can read each other's mm -hmm. mind um, and he just turned around and said um, smiled and he said everything is okay don't worry mm -hmm. and as soon as he said that I came back and I felt <clears throat> vibration between um, like subtle vibration on my right leg mm -hmm. and then all of us all of a sudden my body was vibrating it wasn't like shaking it was like you know, it was, it's really hard to describe that feeling. Mm -hmm. And for a week, I thought, what the hell's going on? I've gone crazy, you know. Um, and um, it's for a week, I felt really, really weird. I was like, I didn't even tell anyone. I was like, oh, you know, people will think I'm crazy. You know, this is just, she's just crazy, imagining things. So I just, just didn't do anything with it until a week later, same thing happened. This was in the middle of the night. I was asleep. Um, ended up in the same place again and I just felt like this bubble of something like an energy or something wrapped around me and I felt so much love like there was a lot of unconditional love that I've never experienced in this world mm -hmm. not even from my parents and it was just it was just then it just felt like like I said, I was home. That's mm -hmm. what it felt like. It was like a place where I'm, I'm from. Mm -hmm. um, and when I came back, and it's just, I was like, you know, it was quite scary. You know, when you feel that vibration, it is quite scary. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, what is going on? It's like it's like a separation of something. No, up, up until that point, I wasn't spiritual mm -hmm. at all. Up until, until that point, and uh, I just randomly, randomly started saying thank you, God, for everything, mm -hmm. and heard the loudest noise that said, "Stay positive and keep going." Mm -hmm. That was the middle of the night. I was like, ran to my mom's room. Did my mom turn into a man <laughs> or something? Because mm -hmm. I felt I was going crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, but that night, the whole point is that night was. The final night where, from a person who couldn't leave the house without having panic attacks, to doing everything, it was like I was given a new pair of eyes. Mm -hmm. Like I just started um, studying. I went. Um, I did photography course and then socialized. Uh, went on helicopter rides and then that led for me in in the last three years working into like your personal development led for me to become a motivational speaker. My mom's quite, she is quite religious. They do believe in these things. Mm. But for me, I told my uncle who I stayed with mm -hmm. in Pakistan, I told him about it. He said not to tell anyone because mm. people will, they're not gonna understand. Yeah, they're gonna judge you. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna judge you. They're not gonna understand. So the only reason I'm sharing this now is whatever your belief is, is fine. But for me, that was life turning. Mm. I just felt like that inner peace just came within me. It mm -hmm. was like nothing in this world matters mm -hmm. except um, except when you know your like when you know your soul, you know when you dig deep within yourself, you know your soul. Mm -hmm. You just have that inner knowing that every obstacle is coming your way is helping you to grow stronger, to helping you your soul to evolve is helping you as a person in this physical world. Um, one thing that came out of that experience is um, it wasn't just um, it wasn't just all rosy. Mm -hmm. I had to sit with myself and bring up all these traumatic life experiences mm -hmm. in order for me to fully heal. So m my line of work is always going to be people going with them themselves and healing those traumatic experiences mm -hmm. because in our society a lot of people run away from things mm -hmm. and situations and when something happens we go partying we distract ourselves keeping ourselves busy you know like socializing like you know um it only it's 
only to extend it helps but then you're you're always burying that junk Mm -hmm. inside of you until it builds up builds up builds up and it causes a lot of anxiety and depression Mm -hmm. i'm still gonna go through a lot of things that um hard hard things but you i have the tools now Mm -hmm. and i want to pass these tools on to other people Mm -hmm. because what's the point going through all these negative life experiences and not to do not do anything about it Mm -hmm. you know Every single person on this planet has a purpose. Um, it's just that purpose is actually buried deep within mm-hmm. that you, but you need to take out the trash mm-hmm. first and then you find out. It's like, uh, okay, I've done all this healing. How do I help people? Give me a sign, universe. I'm a great believer in you know, law of attraction, universe. So <laughs> you, you help me out. Um, and um, it's quite funny, me and my friend was standing, um, we, we were at the Love Attraction meetup and um, we, we were standing outside the building and she was talking about how she's an actress and she gets straight stage fright and she wants to do public speaking. And I was like, what is public speaking? I thought it's just a business conference thing, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but she said, no, you can, you can share your story and everything. So we were, ha- we were discussing about public speaking. While we were talking about public speaking, these two guys popped out of the building talking about public speaking and they teach public speaking Mm -hmm. right and I was like okay a couple of weeks ago I asked for a sign this maybe this is a sign Mm -hmm. I ended up standing in front of over 100 people sharing my story and then three months later I stood in front of 150 people sharing about what I did after the story Mm -hmm. the inner healing I was telling you about Mm -hmm. Um, and then that, that led on for me to be nominated for the Best Female Inspiration Person Award, which I went on to win. I think I want to be a successful uh, speaker. I want to be going around in the world, um, giving uh, talks and like helping people, inspiring people, um, and share the tools that I, I've um, discovered myself to help people because a lot of people in our society are lost. And you have to, have to, take out the distractions and find out what is causing it mm-hmm. what is causing it okay completely yeah. I completely agree so then I guess um, finally really is um, what is your message I mean if you had someone who's going through something that you've been through what is your message that you want to use to encourage them like what is what is it that you think would help them the most from your perspective I think what I keep telling everyone is you are where you need to be so if they're going through darkness right now this that this is the place that they need to be at this very moment because it's making them stronger being in a darkness it it makes you it it's it's the fastest way you can grow as a human being as a soul um so in order to see the light you have to go to the darkness Mm -hmm. and you have to embrace that darkness and embrace the whatever you're going through right now is making you stronger so it's going to make you into a person you're going to become in the next five years ten years Mm -hmm. time and gather all the tools that you have right now in this darkness and take it with you